Hello there, this is Blake Newton from UK Entomology, and this is our introductory video for the Kentucky Keepers program. So Kentucky Keepers is a 4-H program all about invasive species. It's about, it's about educating people about invasive species and also monitoring actual invasive species. And as you'll see, um, people who are part of this program can do either the education part or the monitoring part or both. And if you do enough of it, you can be a certified invasive species educator if you are 4-H staff. So we'll learn about all that stuff as we go here. Okay, so we call this Kentucky Keepers because you are stopping the Kentucky Creepers. So these creeping things that are trying to invade our state, we're trying to stop them. And it's you are the Kentucky Keepers. That means you. You're the ones who are keeping Kentucky safe. Um, so this presentation is basically to introduce the Kentucky Keepers program, where we talk about trapping and monitoring invasive species, and also how to educate about invasive species. And a part of that is the new Certified Invasive Species Educator Program, um, where educators in 4-H can take a certain number of these modules, including this one, and will certify them as an invasive species educator. You don't have to do that part, though you can just learn about this a little bit or do the, the trapping parts on their own as we'll see. And then the other thing we're gonna do in this presentation is learn some just very basic stuff about invasive species in general. So there's a lot of different invasive species in Kentucky and other parts of the world, but you'll see that a lot of them have several things in common. So first, why do we call this Kentucky Keepers? What is a keeper? Um, you know, I, the word itself sounds like you're just keeping a hold of something, like I'm keeping a Coke in my hand, but it means a little bit more than that in this context. Um, so sometimes you'll, we use the word keeper as somebody who is defending or guarding something. So a guard, a defender, or a soldier are sometimes referred to as keepers. So a goalkeeper is keeping a goal safe from something trying to get in there, right? So Kentucky is the goal, and the ball is the invasive species, and you are the Kentucky keeper. Um, also, soldiers are sometimes referred to as peacekeepers, so they're, they're trying to keep the peace or keep invaders out. So we use the word keeper sometimes for that as well. So our goal here is to uh, is for people to learn about invasive species themselves, possibly teach others about invasive species, and to also monitor using uh, uh, some app technology and some GPS technology to monitor actual invasive, spes invasive pests that threaten our borders. And the purpose of, of these modules sort of all together is to learn about these invasive species so that you can teach others. And like I said, a part of that would be the Certified Invasive Species Educator Program if you decide to go that far with it. And then uh, the other part is to learn about the Kentucky Keepers Monitoring Program, where 4-Hers and 4-H staff can actually help monitor for invasive species. Some of you may be doing that already with spongy moth traps. What I want to talk about here, though, is how the Kentucky Keepers Project fits in with some of 4-H's um, learning and um, experiential models. So this one, and you guys are probably familiar with these models and you probably know more about them than I do, and I imagine you can be um, even more creative with figuring out ways that um, projects like Kentucky Keepers fit in with these modules, um, but I think they fit in with them actually pretty well. So this particular 4-H um, module, the Do, Reflect, Apply uh, learning model, is very similar to ones we see in, um, in, in other realms of education as well. But I think this actually fits in really well with the Kentucky Keepers Project. So from my perspective, what I would say the do part here would be uh, go out and, and get started. So instead of maybe lecturing uh, youth about, about invasive species first, start by doing. Go out and say, hey, hey, you know, we're going to go out and put up spongy moth traps. We'll talk about why we're doing that later. So go on a hike, put the traps up, maybe talk a little bit about it. So that would be the do part, and they, they hopefully you get to see, okay, I'm doing something that's, that's apparently useful for some reason. I'm actually getting to go on a hike to do this. So hopefully that kind of leads to some interest. Then the reflect part would be going back, maybe a, on a different day. And then you actually go through a PowerPoint or do our um, invasive species lesson plan to learn more and talk more about invasive species. 
And then the apply part could be that next step, which is actually part of the invasive species lesson plan, where 4-Hers create some kind of presentation about invasive species, maybe some social media about invasive species to teach other people about it. And then the cycle could repeat with who knows, maybe the 4-Hers could take younger kids out to um, find some trees of heaven or look for fire ants or look for um, or put up spongy moth traps and then the, the cycle repeats itself. So uh, that's how Kentucky Keepers could fit in with that particular learning model. And then we have the Thrive model where you start with this developmental context of a few basic elements and these lead to developmental stages of the youth uh, thriving and feeling good about what they're doing, leading to some developmental outcomes and then on to long-term outcomes. But I think we fit really well with some of these developmental um, context, kind of the base level. Uh, I think Kentucky Keepers fits with that pretty well. I think, for instance, one of those is spark. So you can spark interest in, in um, learning about natural resources with a project like this, because I think what it shows is that you can have a career in something, in this case, studying invasive species or learning about insects, that takes you outside. So a, a lot of us um, in the world of, of entomology and even 4-H um, have jobs that take us outside where we learn about nature, and I think that can spark interest. And then also engagement is one of those um, kind of base level um, developmental context pieces. And what we would hope to show with a project like this is that 4-Hers see how they can become engaged to actually help Kentucky monitor for these invasive species. They can see how they can be engaged to be a part of that. And then the voice part of that would be that 4-Hers can present what they've learned maybe to younger 4-Hers about invasive species. Uh, so hopefully you would think that those that in engaging, using their voice and getting sparked would lead to those next step as what ne next steps as well. So I think that um, Kentucky Keepers fits in well with um, the Thrive model. And then we've also got our life skills wheel. Now, uh, depending on how far you take a project like this, how, how much you have your 4-Hers get into it, what kind of products they produce, um, you could imagine um, a whole lot of these life skills applying to the Kentucky Keepers project and so many of the projects that we do in 4-H. But I do think there are a few specific parts of the life wheel, life skills wheel, that the Kentucky Keepers um, project fits really well with. Teamwork is sort of an obvious one. You guys kind of have to work together to go out and either put up traps or to um, uh, uh, find some of these invasive species and to use the apps. So you have to work together to do that. Uh, contributions to a group, a group effort is related to that as well. Responsible citizenship. So this project is all about being a responsible citizen and finding invasive species and learning about why they're a problem. And then uh, this, this whole project is basically a citizen science project. So community service volunteering is what that's all about. And then wise use of resources. Uh, this is all about protecting Kentucky's resources. All of these invasive species cause some kind of problem to our, to our resources, either economically or environmentally. So um, th this, uh, this project encourages wise use of resources. And of course, um, planning and organizing. You've got to get your app ready. You've got to, you've got to figure out where you're going to go, either to look for invasive species or to put up spongy moth traps. You've got to plan on when to bring those traps back in, how to, um, how to time all of that stuff. So those are some specific life skills that I think that the Kentucky Keepers Project fits in with very well. And just a little bit about um, uh, some of the reason that we're doing this, some past successes. So the Kentucky Keepers Program has basically been around for uh, one year now. This is beginning our second year when this module is being recorded. And 2022, um, the, the program was just getting started and really the only component of it of the program was spongy moth trapping and 13 counties participated in that and basically what they did is we mailed them spongy moth traps they put them up in variety in a variety of places they used an app to pinpoint using gps which is very easy to do the app does it all for you they pinpoint with gps where the traps were put up then they go back later bring back the traps and send them to us um, and this allows us to see where spongy moth might be occurring in the state. And this was very valuable because um, 
our department already does this. We do it as, as, part of, as part of the job of this department. We put up spongy moth traps in a grid in certain parts of the state, but we're not, we don't have enough money, basically. We don't have enough funding from the federal government to put as many traps out as we want to. So that's where the Kentucky Keepers come in. Um, we send the traps to you, and you guys put them in places that maybe we wouldn't have thought of. Uh, maybe in counties we aren't expecting the moth to show up. And sure enough, uh, last year we, we caught some things in some unexpected places. We caught some further west in Kentucky than we expected. Um, we also caught them at some different times of the year, a little later in the summer than we expected. And if you go to that um, uh, link down there, it gives a whole report of what was collected last year. Um, but that's why you guys are valuable, is because we are getting additional data um, that we wouldn't have got on our own. And so first, before we get more into what sort of you'll be doing with Kentucky Keepers, what is an invasive species and what are some examples? So we'll go through some examples here. And some of these are things that you probably already know about. You may not have known that they were invasive species. You may not have known that they had things in common with each other. Now, initially here, we're gonna talk about things that aren't necessarily all insects. So at, at this point in time, anyway, the Kentucky Keepers program is mostly about invasive insects. Um, in the future, that might be expanded to some other creatures, but because the entomology department is doing this, our priority is insects right now, and that's, that's the area that we know the best. But we're going to talk about invasive species from sort of other parts of the, the animal and plant kingdom, starting with kudzu here. So I'm sure people in eastern Kentucky know what kudzu is. It's a vine. It kind of looks like grape vine, or it looks a little bit like soybean and it spreads as a vine and uh, what it does is it grows over things so it can grow over basically anything and it grows really really fast so this is one of the things that makes it an invasive, an invasive species it's able to grow really fast and um, it can grow over trees and when it grows over trees it steals their sunlight from them and then the trees eventually die and it does that to all kinds of plants too not just trees so a lot of times eventually where, where kudzu is growing you'll get just a flat area where there's nothing but kudzu left because it has killed all of the other plants. Um, so that those are some things that makes it invasive. It's, it's, it spreads really fast. It's dangerous to other either plants or animals. And nothing really likes to eat this stuff. Um, goats will eat it, but sometimes goats aren't necessarily living a wild in all the places where kudzu might grow in Kentucky. So it tends to spread really fast. It doesn't have really anything that wants to eat it. Um, kudzu was actually brought it to the United States on purpose um, for various reasons, erosion control, um, and it does kind of a good job of that. It will it will help uh, keep soil together, but it also spreads like crazy and we really don't like it. So kudzu is a good example of an invasive species. Also bush honeysuckle. So this is another plant that kind of does a similar thing as, as kudzu. It doesn't grow in a vine, instead it's a bush, but it does the same thing. It's, it reproduces really fast, it spreads quickly, and it steals sunlight from other plants. In particular, um, so if it's growing around a bunch of trees, the trees that are taller than the honeysuckle will do just fine, but the baby trees, the seedlings, can't get any sunlight because the, the honeysuckle is kind of in between the adults and the seedlings, and so new trees aren't able to grow. And so once again, over time, as the old trees die, new trees have a hard time growing, and so you just get honeysuckle. Uh, and once again, very few things will eat honeysuckle, at least they won't eat enough of it. Honeysuckle also blooms its, its leaves earlier in the year than other plants do. So it has several qualities, which makes it a very good invasive species. It's good at being bad. Asian carp is another example in Kentucky that some people might be familiar with. This is more common in Western Kentucky. Um, people will actually go um, Asian carp bow hunting to, to try to, to kill some of these things. There's a lot of them in our waterways in Western Kentucky. They breed really quickly. They were actually brought in on purpose to the United States um, for various reasons to help, uh, to help clean waterways and stuff. And they, they may do some of that stuff, but they also breed like crazy, take over habitat from other fish. So this is another really good example of an invasive species that we don't like in Kentucky. Starling is another one. We've all seen these. These are the huge flocks of kind of smallish black birds that you will see um, during migration season. Uh, these were actually brought in on purpose 
um, by a person in the 1800s uh, who wanted to um, create in uh, Central Park an area where all the birds that Shakespeare mentioned in his plays could all live together uh, as some kind of a stunt, I guess. Um, and so starlings was one of these creatures that was brought over on purpose. Unfortunately, once again, it breeds really fast. It um, doesn't have very many predators. And so now European starling is one of our most common birds in this part of the United States. And, and it's all over the place. So another really good example of an invasive species that we don't like. So hopefully you'll start to see that all these things have things in common. A lot of them breed quickly. They spread quickly. They came over from another place, sometimes accidentally, sometimes on purpose. And then they cause all kinds of problems when they um, get out of control. There's also some surprising invasive species, some things that you might not think of as invasive species, and some things that are kind of debatable about whether they're an invasive species or not. So you see up there the, the regular old honeybee. So the honeybee is a valuable creature, obviously. It, it pollinates a lot of our flowers, a lot of our crops for us. It makes honey and wax, but it was it's not from here. It was brought from an, another country a long time ago, actually about 300 years ago with our settlers. And even though these days it's not really spreading anymore because it's kind of already wherever it's going to go in the United States, but it's believed that over those 300 years or so, when it was after it was brought here, it has spread and dis displaced the habitat of other kinds of bees that we have. So honeybee uh, could be considered an invasive species by some people, um, not as bad as some of our other invasive species because obviously it's beneficial in some ways, but that, could, that could, is considered an invasive species by some people. Also regular old house cat. So that's my cat Sylvia there. Luckily she is contained um, in that plastic box. So that's the, uh, she is not going to get out and become an invasive species. Um, but actually, uh, Keeping cats indoors makes them less likely to become an invasive species, but when they're outside, um, they, once again, they breed quickly. Few things can catch and kill them. We don't have a lot of predators around anymore that can catch and kill a cat. And cats eat a lot of so native songbirds, native rodents, um, and they will, uh, I've had cats before on my own before I knew very much about invasive species that were outdoor cats. They would kill a new unexpected bird or rodent every day, or at least one a day. Uh, and so that's a very common thing that, that house cats can do. So a house cat can be considered an invasive species. Also regular old dog could be considered an invasive species when they become wild. Um, and then down there we've got wild boar. So wild boar is just uh, basically a, um, a regular old farm pig that have gotten loose and that are breeding outdoors. Once they become um, what we call feral or wild, they, um, their behavior changes. Um, they get a little bit more hair on them because they're not wallowing around quite as much. And they become very destructive. They dig up crops. They, um, they actually kill things. And they um, uh, breed like crazy. Uh, so once again, uh, these are all examples of, of invasive species. They're creatures that were, weren't originally from here. So house cat, not originally from here. It was brought over by, by humans sometime in the last few hundred years. Same thing with pig, same thing with, with uh, honeybee. And they've all caused some kind of problem one way or the other, and they've all spread or are spreading uh, to new places. And there are lots of invasive insect species. And we talked a lot about plants and mammals. Um, but there are a lot of invasive insect species. So that's what these modules are mostly about. We'll talk about some of these creatures and more as we go, but some of these are probably ones that you're already familiar with. Brown marmorated stink bug. We'll talk more in detail about that later, but it's a stink bug that's not from the United States. Showed up here 20 years ago or so, and has since spread over a whole bunch of the United States. Asian lady beetle, these are, um, the kind of the pale orange lady beetles with lots of spots. We have lots of lady beetles in Kentucky, but the Asian lady beetle is the one that we don't like. It it's, um, was brought here on purpose, um, actually many years ago, and has since spread uh, all over the United States. It causes problems like eating our native lady beetles, and it also gets into our homes and overwinters there where it creates um, uh, uh, sometimes bad smells, sometimes um, it uh, stains things because it has sort of some orange goo inside of it. So that's an invasive, an invasive insect species. The Asian tiger mosquito. So when you go outside in the suburbs in Kentucky and you get bitten by a mosquito, it's probably the Asian tiger mosquito. 
Um, Asian tiger mosquito, once again, not from Kentucky. It's been uh, brought, brought here accidentally um, and has spread into basically most of the places where humans live in this part of the United States and has become one of our most common mosquitoes. So uh, even, even the, the mosquitoes are invasive. And then regular old Japanese beetle is another one that was brought here accidentally and has, uh, it's a serious plant pest, breeds like crazy again. It eats lots of different things. Um, very few things want to eat it. And uh, another example of invasive species. So these are all invasive species. Asian tiger and mosquito is a good example of one that um, a lot of our invasive species are very good at living around people. They just seem to do really well around places where people live. And so Asian tiger mosquito is particularly good. So all mosquitoes breed in water, breed in water. They put their babies and they put their eggs and their babies in water, and that's where they breed. But Asian tiger mosquito is particularly good at breeding in very small bits of water. The kinds of things that might be around people, like gutters, bird baths, little dog watering bowls, um, animal troughs, things like that. So they are particularly good at breeding and spreading where people live. So we'll see that, that some of our invasive species have that in common. They're really good at living around people areas. So we've mentioned some of these already, but what are some of the traits um, and what are some of the things that invasive species have? In so what are some of the things that invasive species have in common? So we see the definition down there. And this is a kind of a broad definition, but um, it's pretty straightforward. An invasive species is an organism that causes ecological or economic harm in a new environment where it is not native. Um, so uh, that can encompass quite a lot of things, but some things that invasive species are usually going to have in common is that they're new to an area. So a lot of times that means they're from another country or another continent. So many of the things we've mentioned so far in this presentation are from other continents. But sometimes you can have invasive species that are from the same continent. So a coyote is kind of a good example of that. Coyotes are not really originally from Kentucky, but they are here now. Um, they've moved here from the western United States. They're sort of considered an invasive species um, because they are moving into a new area. But, they've, but they're from the United States. They're not from another country. But a lot of our invasive species are from other countries. And when they get here, a lot of them can breed or spread fast. Uh, the kudzu vine spreads and grows really fast. The Asian carp lays lots of eggs, has lots of babies. The uh, Asian um, lady beetle has lots of eggs. So a lot of these things breed fast. Our invasive species tend to either take resources or actually kill local plants and animals. So kudzu is once again a good example of that. And bush honeysuckle, they steal sunlight from other plants. And then they end up stealing the area where those other plants used to grow as well. Um, things like our Asian lady beetle kills local lady beetles. So um, and it also eats a lot of the, the food that they would normally be eating, the aphids and other things that they would normally be eating. So it's stealing things from them. And a lot of times our, um, these new species that come into an area, the predators and plant eaters in that new area are simply not adapted to, to eat them or hunt them. So kudzu, once again, very few things will eat it. So it just keeps on spreading. Bush honeysuckle, very few insects or mammals want to eat it, so it just keeps on spreading unchecked. Uh, so many of these things simply aren't attacked um, and eaten by local things. Now you see in that little blue box, we have some traits that invasive species sometimes have in common, but not always. So some of our invasive species are either venomous or poisonous in some way. We'll talk more about the cane toad in a minute that's poisonous. Um, but our Asian ladybug is an example of one that has nasty tasting chemicals in its body. Not really poisons exactly because it's not, not uh, super dangerous or toxic, but few things want to eat it because it tastes so bad. And so some of our other invasive species are in one way venomous or poisonous as well. And then many of our invasive species are in some way associated with sort of people areas, what I call weedy or disturbed areas, places where people are living and we do stuff like build new houses, plow up land, leave a lot of bare soil, um, create open areas where lots of sunlight gets in. Um, and we'll see uh, as we go that many of our invasive species tend to like those areas. We mentioned the Asian tiger mosquito and how it likes the little bits of water rather than big ponds or lakes. It likes those little bits of water around people, little gutters, bird baths. 
And then kudzu is something that likes big, open, sort of sunny fields, so places where we've plowed, where those seeds can get in, and the kudzu can really start taking over. Um, dandelion is an example of one that likes our nice sunny lawns, and that's a place where it can start to spread. So uh, invasive, invasive species sometimes either do really well or sometimes get started in places where people are living and digging up stuff and moving things around and creating openings for the sun. So now we're going to talk about some of the ways that invasive species get to a new area. And we're going to do that with some examples here. So cane toads, this is something that's not in the United States. Actually, they are in Hawaii in the United States, but they're not in um, the continental United States. But cane toads is a very interesting case study in invasive species, a really interesting one to learn about. So cane toads are actually originally from South America. They're just a big brown toad. We'll see some here in a minute. Um, and in 1935, Australia was having problems with something called the sugarcane beetle. It was eating their sugarcane crops. So Australia uh, actually went to Hawaii and found some cane toads and brought them to Northeast Australia on purpose. They brought 102 of these cane toads there and released them because they had some evidence that Cane toads like to eat beetles, so they thought that the cane toads would, would control this beetle for them. So they dumped these toads out, and as it turned out, unfortunately, the cane toads don't really eat the cane beetles very often. They eat basically all kinds of things. They don't particularly go after the cane beetle very much. And then they also learned that the cane toads are poisonous. They have little poison glands on the back of their, um, the, right behind their head, that oozes out this white gunk that makes... Uh, cane toads poisonous for predators that try to eat them. So very few creatures will ever try to eat cane toads. So here's an example once again of something that uh, a new species into a new area that nothing wants to eat. Cane toads breed quickly. They spawn in little ponds. They put all these eggs in there. The eggs are actually a tiny bit poisonous on their own and then the eggs turn into tadpoles that are poisonous. So very few fish will eat them while they're underwater. So once again, lots of fast breeding. And then cane toads are even large enough to eat native Australian animals. And we'll see here if our video works to show you this. So he's packing it all in there. And so as you can see, this cane toad kind of looks like just a kind of a regular brown toad, like the American toad we have here in Kentucky, but it's much larger, large enough to actually eat animals. I'm not trying to tell you about cane toad to make you afraid of them. We're not in any danger of them becoming uh, loose in Kentucky, but um, they are uh, a really good example of an invasive species. Um, another good example, and that, and by the way, uh, the cane toad, the reason it, the reason we were talking about it is because that's an example of an invasive species that was brought here on purpose for some reason and ended up causing a problem. Uh, so we'll see that some of our invasive species are like that, but some of them are like this. So hammerhead worm. This is a worm creature that actually does live in Kentucky. Um, it's called a hammerhead worm because its head looks a little bit wide up there. It's actually been in the USA a long time. Um, it was uh, uh, brought here accidentally, probably in potted plants, nursery plants, in soil, and just got loose and started spreading. So here's one that, that didn't come here on purpose. It was brought here accidentally just by shipping things around. That happens with invasive species pretty frequently. But then once it gets here, it eats regular earthworms. So earthworms are really important for um, keeping our soil healthy. They break up soil, help to um, sort of turn over that soil. So these guys eat earthworms. That's not good for our earthworms or our soil, but they also ooze 
poison from their skin that makes them uh, protected from predators. And it also uh, can cause irritation to people who pick them up. Uh, so this is a creature that causes problems not only in the soil to earthworms, but also to people who accidentally pick them up. And they can breed by breaking part, off parts of their body. So this is another creature that breeds really fast. So how do invasive species get to new places? Sometimes people bring them here on purpose. Uh, sometimes people bring them accidentally just by shipping things around. Sometimes invasive species move around by like on floating debris uh, uh, from storms on the ocean. Um, that's a little less common. That's actually how species moved around, you know, through the millions of years before people were moving things around on boats and stuff like that. But invasive species sometimes move around uh, that way as well. And so once you've got these invasive species, and there's, and there's a lot of them, that we've, as we've already seen, there are a lot in Kentucky, there's a lot in other parts of the world. What are some things that uh, kind of local, state, and federal entities do to try to combat these invasive species? So there's four basic strategies, and we'll talk about the, these strategies more as we go. We really want um, 4-Hers to understand these strategies because it's kind of a, a big part of what Kentucky Keepers is all about is picking one or more of these strategies to try to help um, prevent invasive uh, or slow down invasive species. So um, the first step would be prevention. This is where you're trying to keep invasive species from coming in in the first place. So you're taking a, what we would call a proactive step. So these would involve things like actual laws or quarantines, some import laws, um, inspections of things that are being brought into the country. So as new plants are coming in, they're inspected to see if invasive species are there. There are laws that certain kinds of plants or certain kinds of, uh, or plants from certain quarantine areas where invasive species are likely to come from can't just come into the country without some kind of inspection. Um, we've heard about like the, how the USDA has uh, um, dogs at airports that actually sniff out possible invasive species that might be coming in soil. Um, uh, and also, uh, you know, fruit diseases and things like that would be considered an invasive species that could come in. So laws, quarantines, checkpoints, things to keep invasive species from coming in in the first place. That would be prevention. Then you have monitoring. So monitoring is where um, an invasive species is kind of suspected, it's kind of imminent, and we're monitoring to see where it shows up first. Uh, and so this would involve stuff like the spongy moth trap that we'll talk about later that our, our Kentucky keepers have already been doing. So the spongy moth already exists in places like West Virginia and Pennsylvania. Um, we think it could show up in Kentucky. Actually, some do show up in Kentucky. And we put up these traps to kind of see where they are, see if their populations are growing. Um, so we monitor what's going on with invasive species. Also, we can monitor by having public pest, hot, pest hotlines where the pest is out uh, or the public is out keeping their eye out for pests for us and letting us know if they see any. So that's a way of monitoring. And then education is a big part as well. Um, if we can teach people how to identify invasive species, um, they'll be more likely to help us monitor for them. Um, we can also do things like train people how to identify or control invasive species. And we can also uh, educate people about things that they can do to keep invasive species from moving around. A really good example of that one is the, the don't move firewood slogan that we have related to some of our invasive species that are beetles that travel um, that travel inside wood. So um, by not moving firewood, say from Ohio, where some of these beetles live, to Kentucky, where the beetles haven't been found yet, um, that's a way to, if we educate people to do that um, and educate people of the importance of it, they'll be less likely to spread. So education is a component. And then the, the final component would be considered control. This is where the invasive species is pretty much already there and you're trying to slow it down, maybe keep it from going to new places, maybe keeping it from building up really large populations, doing whatever you can to slow it down or, or in some cases get rid of it. So in many cases we use pesticides. So um, 
this, this, the, uh, uh, or, or we can remove host plants in, in the case of some of our beetles that attack trees. We will actually go in sometimes and remove the whole tree, or and sometimes the trees next to that tree to, to, in case they have spread without our knowledge. Um, so there are um, a lot of different ways that we might control. So you can, you can imagine the steps, the steps that are involved. So let's say there's a species from another country that we suspect could be a problem that isn't here yet. So we create, we try to prevent it from coming. We create, create laws, we put quarantines um, on that country so that it's harder to spread that creature here. Um, if that creature is likely to show up, we have monitoring set up. We put up traps, we tell the public about it so that they can call in any uh, examples that they find. And we also try to educate people about it. We try to educate what does that creature look like? What problems is it gonna cause when it gets here? The more people, the more that people understand how big of a problem these things are, the more likely they are to help. Um, we train um, experts who may, might work at state parks or, or um, other kinds of entities where uh, invasive species might show up. So we educate. And then once an invasive species does show up, we try to go and wipe it out as best we can. We'll, we'll take insecticides, to populations of it, we'll remove host plants. And then we might even increase or uh, intensify the monitoring around a known in infestation. So those are those are kind of the main steps or strategies to dealing with invasive species. And uh, by the way, uh, uh, Kentucky keepers could potentially be involved with uh, at least three of those, right? Prevention, trying to keep things from coming in, monitoring, uh, monitoring, uh, putting up traps, monitoring uh, by sending us pictures of things that you see, and educating other people about invasive species. We won't have you guys go out and put any pesticides on invasive species, though. We'll have somebody else do that. So, um, why are we even doing this? So, invasive species are all over the place. They've been here a long time. There's been lots of different ones. Why are we doing Kentucky Keepers now? Why are invasive species in important in Kentucky and why right now? You may notice that I look a little different here. That's because I had to re-record this part because things have changed since we made the, uh, this video. So um, what this slide shows is Kentucky and how Kentucky happens to be a place where a lot of invasive species are either coming soon or are already in our state. Um, part of the reason for this is because just like during the Civil War, Kentucky was not quite north and not quite south. We're kind of in the middle. So all those creatures that have been, been invading the U.S. from the north are making their way toward us. And a lot of the ones that started maybe on the southern coasts have also been coming up toward us from the south. So these things are kind of all converging at once. And the thing that has changed here is spotted lanternflies. So You'll see there that the yellow arrows are showing creatures that are already in Kentucky, and the orange arrows are things that are maybe not quite in Kentucky, uh, and maybe hopefully will never get here. So when we first made this uh, slideshow, Spotted Lanternfly still had an orange arrow, but uh, since uh, summer of 2023, it is found in Kentucky as well. But this does show you um, at least most of the important invasive species that we'll be talking about in Kentucky Keepers. So spotted lanternfly, emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle, and spongy moth uh, kind of threaten Kentucky from the north. And you've got things like sugarcane aphid, Asian longhorn tick, imported fire ant, and hemlock woolly adelgid coming to us from the south. So we'll, we'll show this slide uh, other times during the Kentucky Keepers um, certification videos. And it's just an important thing to remember that um, Kentucky is kind of a hotbed of invasive activity right now. So what can we do? If you're a Kentucky keeper, if you're an agent or a 4 -er, what can you do to actually help with some of this stuff? So that's that's the name of the game. That's why we're here. So the, the, the first thing that you can do and really the main thing, and this is something that everybody can do, is just learn about it yourself. Learn more about invasive species which is what you're doing right now. The more you know about it, the more you can kind of casually spread this information to other people. Uh, the more likely that, uh, the more people who learn about this, the more likely they are to spot an invasive species and help to tell us about it. But then the next step up from that would be to educate others. 
So um, if you're taking these modules, you might uh, be thinking about educating other people about invasive species. A 4 h -er can do this by teaching other kids in their, in their school or teaching at a club at their extension office. Um, it would be really great like if you are already have to do some kind of project for school and the topic is open, invasive species would be a really great topic. We'll talk more about that in one of our other modules as well. Um, so include invasive species on homework assignments and school projects. Um, you can also help by spreading the word about our report a pest email. Um, this is an email that's created by our Office of the State Entomologist. It's for people to send pictures to if they think they found one of our invasive species. So one of these things you're doing in this module is learning what our invasive species look like. If you teach people about what they look like and then tell them about this report a pest email, if one of those people, the more people we have out there, the more eyes we have looking for these, the more likely they are to see that Asian longhorn beetle when it first shows up, for instance, and report it back to us. So we really want you to educate other people about invasive species. And then the third step, um, depending on how much you want to get involved with this, would be to actually monitor the invasive species using our app. And we're going to talk about that, how that works here in a little bit as well. And then so um, what can just sort of regular people do to help? So if you're a member of the Kentucky Keepers program, you can actually monitor using our app. You can maybe create presentations and teach other people. But regular people can help too. And this is kind of the word that you can spread around to them. If they think that, they've, that they see one of these insects that's invasive and they're not quite sure about it, um, a really good thing to do is collect it in a little plastic container, like a little Tupperware container, and put it in the freezer. Uh, and then, um, and then at, that'll preserve the bug. And then, at their convenience, they can take it to an extension office, and they can say, "Hey, is this that invasive species that I've heard about?" Um, and it would be really good to put a little piece of paper in that container showing the location where they found it, and then the address. Uh, and I should have said also the, the date where they found it as well. They should put the date and either the address or the GPS coordinates. If they can't collect it, they can take a picture and then either take a picture to their extension office or they can send photos of suspected um, invasive species. I'll show this email again, the report a pest at, UK, at uky.edu website. You can actually attach pictures in there and make a little note of the date and the place where you found this creature. And if it's something that we suspect might be an invasive species, um, we can investigate. Please don't send um, pictures that you found on the web to try to trick us because we reverse in, we reverse image search these things and we found several people who have done that to us for some reason. I'm not sure why, but um, please send us actual pictures of creatures that you've seen um, out in the wild. So, so this is what regular people do. This is what you guys can tell how regular people can help us. So now we're going to talk about the monitoring program. So we've talked about uh, kind of the education about invasive species. And there's going to be more modules that talk specifically about spotted lanternfly, about um, imported fire, and some of these other creatures. Um, but what we're going to talk about now is, is our monitoring program. And if, if you want to be a part of the monitoring program, and so this is how it works. The monitoring program would be considered um, voluntary. You can be a Kentucky keeper by just learning about invasive species, by teaching about invasive species. The monitoring program is kind of the next step. And so currently, we are actively monitoring with Kentucky Keepers three creatures. Uh, and these are the three. And you don't have to monitor all of these. You can kind of tell us which ones you want to do. Uh, and we will, t we, will have, we will have modules showing you how to use the app to monitor them. Uh, but the three that you can kind of choose from are the spongy moth. It's a creature that used to be known as the gypsy moth. Uh, we have a whole module about this creature. It's a moth that eats the leaves off trees and causes huge problems. Um, Kentucky Keepers can help with this one by actually putting up orange sticky traps. They're about the size of, of a small shoe, you, and they're very lightweight. You hang them in trees pretty much any place in the state. You enter into an app where you placed, where and when you placed that trap, and then you go get it at the end of the summer and send it to us, and we look in those to see if any spongy moth had been caught. Um, this is, like I said, what we did last year where um, uh, uh, Kentucky, Kentucky, and Kentucky Keepers helped us a lot with this. And then we've added two new creatures this year. So one is the spotted lanternfly. This is a um, creature sort of related to cicadas and aphids. 
Um, it's about an inch long. It eats all kinds of plants, especially some orchard plants and grapes. Um, and so it causes lots of problems in those areas. It's not in Kentucky yet, but has been found in southern Ohio and southern Indiana. Uh, and so we really want people to know about this. Um, you don't have to put up a trap for this one. This one would be just an example of if you see it, you can enter it into our app. Very easy to do. And then imported fire ant is, is similar. If you want to get involved with, with imported fire ant, um, you would, uh, if you see one or see one of their mounds, you would enter it into our app for us. You don't actually have to set up traps for that one. So like I said, you can do all three of these or just one or two. Um, and then uh, you, uh, we will teach you more about these. If your county decides, okay, we really want to focus on spotted lanternfly, but we don't want to do fire ants. Um, there's a whole module just for spotted lanternfly where you can learn more about its biology, learn why it's a problem, and learn how to enter its info into the app. And so which one of these, which one or two or three of these creatures should you pick for this, for your county if you wanted to do this? Um, there's sort of some pros and cons here depending on sort of where you live. Spongy moth, we really want coverage of this all over Kentucky. We would love to have these traps hanging in as many places as possible. The creature is more likely to show up in the east, so it would be really nice to have more traps in eastern counties, but we don't have as much funding to put traps in western counties, so in some ways it's almost even more valuable to have traps there because we don't have our grid of traps there. Uh, and we did find one further west than we suspected last year thanks to Kentucky Keepers. So we really want counties from all over the state to participate in this. So if you want to get involved with um, Spongy Moth, please let me know. And then um, Spotted Lanternfly, uh, they're, mostly likely, they're most likely to show up in northern Kentucky because that's where they've been found is in southern Indiana and southern Ohio. But there's an, another interesting thing about Spotted Lanternfly, it, it tends to breed um, really quickly on something called Tree of Heaven, which is a, a different invasive species. And we really want to know where all the trees of heaven are located in the state. This would be very helpful to us because if we know that, for instance, that spotted lanternfly are starting to show up, let's say in Kenton County, it would be really good to know where all the trees of heaven are. That way we can go there, see if those uh, the spotted lanternfly is attracted to them and it breeds on them quickly. So we can go to those trees of heaven, see what's going on with the spotted lanternfly, and maybe even remove those trees of heaven to make it less likely the spotted lanternfly can breed as quickly. Um, so the spotted lanternfly project, even if you don't see any spotted lanternflies, you can tell us where Tree of Heaven is. That's very valuable. And people all over the state can do that because Tree of Heaven can be found just about anywhere. And then fire ants. Um, fire ants have, have shown up in kind of the McCreary County area and is slowly moving north. Um, but we think we found some of these as far north as Danville. So it would, it would be kind of useful anywhere in sort of the central, maybe all the way over to the Mammoth Cave area, uh, for people to be on the lookout for these things. Once again, you don't have to set up a trap for a fire ant, but you could maybe uh, go on a hike or something and, and see if you see fire ants or suspected mounds, you can send pictures to, of them to us in the app. Um, there's, there's a couple of timing issues with these. If you want to do spongy moth trap, you have to tell us, you have to tell us about it in the spring because the traps have to be put up in early summer and then they're taken back up in late summer. But the other two here, spotted lanternfly or fire ants, um, you can enter that data at any time. Uh, so those are those are something that really anybody can do at any time. All they have to all they have to do is download the app and learn how to use the app. And if they see one of those creatures or tree of heaven, they can tell us about it. The app we're talking about is called ArcGIS Survey One Two Three. It's available for free on Apple or Android. Um, we actually will have a, we have a whole separate video showing how to download and install and use this app. Um, when you get the app, you, uh, you have to enter a, um, a, a login and a password. Uh, every county will have its own login. Just ask us what your login is. It will, be, uh, it will probably look very similar to those there in that box with the county name, followed by CES for County Extension Service then an underscore, and then OSE for Office of the State Entomologist. That will be your login. And then your password is the same for all of them. It's OSE Surveys 1 down there. Uh, so you will use the same password. Uh, but if you're, if you're confused about what your login and password is, please just contact me directly. 
Then the next steps would be if you decided you want to be involved in the monitoring, um, the, the, uh, the next step after watching this module would be to do these steps. So the first thing would be decide which of those creature or creatures you actually want to uh, uh, want to get involved with surveying. Then um, you need to find out from us uh, the Nearpod code for so each of these creatures will have its own Nearpod module. We'll have one for Spongy Moth, one for Spotted Lanternfly, one for Important Fire Ant. Uh, you'll want to watch one of those to learn more about that creature and learn how to use the app with that creature. You'll need a code for it. Basically, when you um, go to that the uh, Nearpod uh, backslash student, it will ask you for your name and then it will ask for a code. We will give you the code. We have a website where we're going to try to put the codes, and if uh, you can't find them on that website, just ask me directly. Just email me if you have trouble finding those codes or if you have trouble with Nearpod. It's all going to be done through Nearpod. So go to, um, go to Nearpod, enter the code for the module that you need, and then when it asks you for your name, we're going to ask you to use this format. We want you to use your last name, then a little dash, then your first name, then a little dash, and then the county. Um, try to use that every time so as you take new modules, we can keep track of your progress so that we know who is actually taking, the, taking these modules. Next, you would watch the lesson, you would watch the module, and there'll be questions embedded in the lesson. Um, and there'll be sort of what the video will stop and it will ask you a question about information you've just seen and you will answer that question. And uh, we ask that to people who are doing the monitoring program, uh, not, not necessarily the 4 Hers, but the, but the people who are leading, the, the agents, the uh, assistants, and, and staff and volunteers would be, would be used to score 80% or more on those questions. Then you would assemble your Kentucky Keepers team. These would be your 4 Hers. Um, now your 4 Hers, they don't have to do these modules. You, you can have them look through the videos if you want to. We will also have the, the, um, the presentations unnarrated if you'd like those as well. Um, but really the goal here is that, that you as extension staff and um, uh, other volunteers would be the ones taking the modules and then passing that information on to youth. But you would assemble your Kentucky Keepers team and then they could either watch the Nearpod lessons or you can teach them about them themselves. Once again, if you um, if you want to do Spongy Moth, you need us to do you need us to know that we need to know that kind of uh, ex extremely late May, uh, late spring, early summer, May first is what we're asking for this year. But that might change a little bit. So you watch those lessons to learn about the creatures, and then you download that Survey One Two Three app, and then watch the video that shows how to use that app, and then you go out and start monitoring. And so uh, the, uh, the, the modules is where you will learn how to monitor for each of those creatures. If any, I know this sounds like a lot of steps and it's all very confusing. Some of this is just sort of um, common sense, but please just ask me questions. We want people to participate in this. We want it to be easy. Um, if there's something that isn't quite explained, um, we can um, talk to you directly. Also, I, I'm, I'm happy to, once, you get your, once you've gotten your Kentucky Keepers team assembled, Maybe you've watched the module, but you still have more questions. We can Zoom with you guys to answer more questions about how to do this. Um, so um, we're trying to make it as easy as possible. Once you use the app one time, you will see that it's easy to use, but obviously there's a learning curve with any kind of new, um, new technology, but hopefully you will see it's pretty easy to use. These are the modules that we're gonna have so far. We might add more in the future. Um, but uh, uh, these, are, these are what they are. And so we mentioned earlier the Certified Invasive Species Educator Program. This is for 4-H staff, so extension agents, extension assistants. This could also be somebody like a volunteer if they wanted to do this. Um, if, you, if you want to go further with this and actually be what we call a Certified Invasive Species Educator, we're going to ask you to take basically five of these modules out of the seven that we have so far. And the ones in yellow would be what we call required. So the yellow ones there are the invasive species basics, which is this module. So you're already part of the way there. Then you'll see down on number six, we have created a lesson plan about invasive species. And we teach you as an instructor how to use that lesson plan. We go through the whole thing. It's kind of like a teacher's guide. Um, so that would be one that would be required. And then we also have a separate module on how to teach about invasive species. This goes through a whole lot of stuff, including um, what's good language to use um, about invasive species. And then, so you would take those three and then any two others, any two of the other creatures there. So you see that two through five are the different invasive species that we have modules for. 
So if you wanted to be a certified invasive species educator, you would take those three in yellow, plus any two of the others, spongy moth, spotted lanternfly, imported fire ant, or we have another module that goes through a handful of other important invasive insect species. Now, if you don't want to be a certified educator and you just want to learn about spotted lanternfly and how to monitor for that, that's fine. Just take this module you're doing right now, take the spotted lanternfly module, and then you'll learn everything you need to know about spotted lanternfly, uh, spotted lanternfly from both the education standpoint of it and how to monitor for it. But if you want to take this a little further and actually get, actually get a certificate, um, and that, that would be where you would take five of these modules, as we said. So please ask me if you have more questions about the certific certification program, how to use Nearpod, et cetera. This is, so this is what Nearpod looks like. So when you go to Nearpod, um, you type in, uh, as a student who's taking a module, uh, you, t you go to nearpod.com back, backslash student, and this is what the screen looks like. And this is where you enter the code for the specific module you are taking right then. You have probably already done that with this module you're taking right now. But if you're watching this module on some other format like YouTube, that's how it works. You see that, join a lesson, you enter a code that we give you, and then you go in and the video starts and it asks you some questions. Oh, but it also will ask you your name. For your name, once again, please use the format last name dash first name dash county. This is so we can keep track of who is doing this. This is, this is especially important if you want to become certified as an invasive species educator, because then we'll see that you've taken all the modules that you need to do, and we know who you are. You're able to, you, you're able to enter in uh, a different name every time, but please don't do that. Please enter the same name in that format every time so we can keep track of your progress. And then each module will have its own code. We are, we'll have a variety of ways to get you those codes. We'll email them to you. You can email me and ask for them, but we're also gonna to try to keep them updated on that website there, um, the entomology.ca.uky.edu, KY Keepers resources page. We're gonna have several things on there, including the Nearpod codes. We're gonna have links to YouTube versions of these presentations in case you don't want to do them on Nearpod. And um, we're also going to have our lesson plan in PDF format there, so we're going to keep several things there. That's going to be uh, going to kind of be your one-stop shop for um, places you need to learn more about Kentucky keepers. Aha! And this year uh, we also have some swag for people who participate in this program. It's going to be a clip knife. A clip knife is useful for Kentucky keepers because, at, uh, especially for people who do the spongy moth trap, because you put the spongy moth trap up with zip ties, and you, uh, the best way to take a zip tie down is by cutting it. So um, we have a branded knife here that's going to say Kentucky Keepers on one side and have the report of pest email on the other side. Uh, and this can be given to anyone who participates in this program. Now, you may want to use some discretion. Certainly as an agent, as an assistant, as an adult um, uh, volunteer with this program, we definitely want to give you guys these pocket knives. We're going to have lots of pocket knives. If you want to give them to your youth, if you think that maybe we're working with high school or older middle school, uh, who you think might be responsible enough with a pocket knife, uh, you, you, can, you can distribute those at your discretion. I mean, Boy Scouts are given pocket knives all the time. Um, but if you don't feel that, that that's appropriate for your particular youth, um, we can give them just to you. Um, this, this is what we're doing this year for swag. Uh, we're going to try to change this every year. We thought about things like t-shirts and hoodies, but the, it's so hard to get the right, right kind of sizes. So we're going to experiment with different things over the years to try to keep people um, involved with this project. But that's what we're doing this year. So let us know who's participated and, um, and uh, we can send you those pocket knives at the end. This will basically happen at the end of uh, kind of the, the next season, which will be somewhere around spring 2024 is when we would give you those knives. But um, in addition to that pocket knife thing, we want to keep on keeping on with Kentucky Keepers. We don't want you to just do this this year. It will be more valuable to us and hopefully valuable to you if this is a project that you stick with and do over time to make it um, kind of a priority for if you have a nature club, an environmental club, an outdoors club, an animal club, something like that in your county, if this is a this is kind of a permanent part. 
something that they do all the time. It doesn't have to be a lot of time, right? Putting up spongy moth traps just takes a little while. Keeping your app handy in case you see a fire ant mound is not something that takes a lot of time. So this could be something where you just address it once or twice a year and then let your um, 4-Hers know that they are still monitoring for invasive species. But we want you to keep doing this. So we want you to tell us, how can we improve this program? How can we make it um, more fun? How can we make it... Uh, uh, how can we make it feel more like you are contributing? Because you are contributing by giving us this data. Um, you are helping us to keep track of these invasive species. So what are some things that we can do to make it known to you and your 4 Hers that what you're doing is valuable for you? How can we make it more attractive to participate? What is, what's some kinds of swag maybe that you would like to see in the future? We talked about the idea of maybe some kind of mini symposium at the end of each year. We haven't committed to something like that yet, but that might be something fun to do as well. Um, but we have um, Qualtrics link down there. Please go to that Qualtrics link. This is a new link we created for this year to give us ideas on how um, uh, it's also a, it's also a survey to show kind of how you are participating already. So it helps to keep track of that. But also, what are some things we can do in the future to make this an even better program so that um, so that you keep participating and so that more counties are participating in this invasive species monitoring and education. And so that's it for this module. Um, so the, the, the kind of the main people who are, are, are in, in charge of the 4-H part of the Kentucky Keepers program are myself. I'm doing the modules. Uh, and I'm uh, kind of working with the counties on getting this rolled out. And then Carl Harper, he's a member of the Office of the State Entomologist. He handles the technology side of this. He's built this entire app that we use, and he monitors the information that you guys send in. He's also an invasive species expert. He's one of the people that actually looks at the spongy moth traps when you send them in um, to see if a spongy moth has been found on there. So that's all we have for this first module. Once again, please ask me if you have any questions about where to go next for Nearpod or how to get a hold of traps, how to use ArcGIS, and so forth. And we hope to see you on more of these in the future.